In this WrestleTalk news, a major WWE star potentially walks out of WWE, an update on Vince McMahon's creative control, and Tempest's review of last night's SmackDown. Subscribe and enable notification to always on for daily wrestling news videos. Support WrestleTalk! After an absolutely abysmal Monday Night Raw, expectations were extremely tempered ahead of last night's SmackDown. But you know what? It wasn't too bad. At least there was actually a fair bit of wrestling on the show. Among the matches on SmackDown was an excellent opener between the always winning combination of the Brawling Brutes and Imperium, continuing Gunter and Sheamus' saga, which is always nice to see. But wait a minute, isn't there a missing piece of the puzzle there? A Drew McIntyre shaped piece? Yes. McIntyre was glaringly absent from SmackDown, with PW Insider Elite revealing that while WWE had Drew planned for the show, they would later pull him from their plans. Not only that, but Drew was also planned for an autograph signing for Cricket Wireless, but would also be pulled from appearing, being replaced by Gunta de Ringenero. Now, while Wade Keller of PW Torch had reported that another health issue for Drew could be the reason for WWE's decision, it could also potentially be related to the ongoing uncertainty over his WWE contract. Keller would report that McIntyre and WWE's recent failure to come to a new terms on a new deal relates to Drew's unhappiness with both his current creative and of course those sweet sweet dollar bills. Keller said there's been talk that he is unhappy with his current situation in WWE and I'm hearing it's kind of a mix of creative and money and what kind of offer he's getting for renewal. It sounds like WWE is taking seriously the possibility he's going to let his deal run out rather than agree to something that he believes is less than he deserves or less than what he thinks he has coming. Keller would add that from what he's heard, the situation will be decided pretty quickly one way or the other. Lastly, Keller adds that McIntyre's absence could also be related to the fact that the triple threat IC title match at WrestleMania was just pretty bloody sore and McIntyre either requested or was given time to recover. Tempest, come on here, over here, buddy, and let's show everyone what happened at WrestleMania. Give me them chops. Oh, oh, dude, come on, come on, come on. You're a wrestler. Ah! 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 Keller believes that instead of one thing being the reason for Drew's absence, it's more likely to be a bit of everything. That was so, dude. You asked for it. I feel like my nipple's gonna fall out. While McIntyre may not be too pleased with WWE's creative, I think it's safe to say we all share that sentiment, following a one-two punch of Cody losing to Roman and Monday's Raw. So, when it came to SmackDown, the apprehension was at all-time high, especially given WWE's announcement that Triple H was set for yet another WWE Universal dress. Would he be leaving? Would he be publicly re relinquishing control back to Vince? Nah, he just announced the draft. <laughs> Ew. Well, thankfully, at least on the surface, the Triple H era resumes. However, did the black cloud of Vinnie Mac still looming over SmackDown's creative plans? Was he there in the flesh, ripping up the scripts and replacing them with almost matches? Absolutely no more sapien. Don't worry about that. Fightful Select would report on Thursday that higher ups within WWE believed and hoped that SmackDown would return to the type of show we saw during Triple H's creative. And thankfully, as we mentioned earlier, the show wasn't too bad, which would obviously suggest that this wasn't a Vince show and like Raw. According to PW Insider Elite, Vince was in fact not in Portland for SmackDown. However, Figure 4 Wrestling Online's Dave Meltzer would reveal that he did review creative plans remotely, but only made minor changes to the script. This would seem to be the case, as unlike Monday, Fightful Select's traditional rundown of SmackDown would prove to be 100% accurate to what ended up taking place. While this is obviously a cause for celebration and optimism, woo yay, PW Insider reported that there is a wait and see attitude backstage. However, morale has reportedly improved since Monday. Would you look at that, Vince's lack of presence equals happiness. Take a hint, pal. 
take the hint. Thailand also reportedly feels that if Vince continues to only be present remotely going forward, then shows should continue to be run in a similar creative fashion as prior to WrestleMania. The hope in the locker room is that Vince was only so heavily involved with Raw due to him already being in LA for Mania. And maybe if last night was any indication, that could be the case. All right, let's, well, yeah, fingers crossed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, after many, many weeks of handshakes, I might bring in my tag team partner. Tempest coming, coming to the camera. It's time for the greatest handshake in all of handshakes in WrestleTalk history. You ready? Sure. All right, that me up. Uh, 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 hey. Too sweet. <laughs> yeah, you did it. Oh, <laughs> A big shout out to this video's pledge hammers. He ran Aaron Hanrahan and the machine gun, Alex Anderson. You can get your own custom wrestling nickname by signing up at patreon.com forward slash Russell talk. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, Sat, we'll get there. This is Tempest, and this is my review of SmackDown in about five minutes. So we kick off this WrestleMania Fallout edition of SmackDown with a good old-fashioned Donnybrook between Imperium and the Brawling Brutes. While it does feel like we've seen this sort of match a lot the last nine months, I just can't get tired of seeing it. The story here was the teamwork of Imperium was impeccable, while Walter did his best to keep Sheamus from tagging in. Sure enough, after Walter hit his powerbomb on Ridge Holland for a near fall, Sheamus tagged into a big ovation, clobbering Walter before hitting the bro kick on Giovanni Vinci for the win. It would appear that Sheamus is still at the front of the queue for an IC title shot with this win, and again, who could ever get tired of seeing that? A very fun opener this was, four out of five. Backstage, Kayla Braxton asks Paul Heyman about why Brock Lesnar turned on Cody Rhodes, and Paul ignores that question to boast about Roman Reigns. Jey Uso walks up and asks where Jimmy is, and Paul tells him that Jimmy is at home watching, so Jay can prove himself tonight and solve the Sami Zayn problem. Jay walks off, and Paul tells Solo Sokoa that if Jay can't solve the Sami Zayn problem, then Solo needs to solve their problems. Ominous. Ricochet then took on Ivar of the Viking Raiders. This was very straightforward. Ivar worked him over, Ricochet tried to lift Ivar but hurt his back doing so, and all this built to a finish where Ricochet hit a springboard Hurricane Rana and a shooting star press for the win. There was nothing wrong with it, but there wasn't anything more to it than that. Three out of five. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn are backstage, and Kevin is excited to put the Bloodline stuff behind them after Sami's match with Jay Uso, but Sami tells him that he feels obligated to go talk to Jay. KO tells him that this is a bad idea, but knows he can't talk Sami out of it. Raquel Rodriguez and Liv Morgan then took on Natalia and Shotzi, who say they should be the ones getting the tag title shot instead of Raquel and Liv in an inset promo. Personally, I would think it would be the team that actually won at WrestleMania, but what do I know? I know Ronda's hurt, but why would they win that match if that was the case? This was another fairly quick match as Raquel and Liv worked over Shotzi until Natalia dragged her partner to the corner to tag in and they went for the heart attack only to be countered with Liv hitting Shotzi with an assisted DDT and then the oblivion for the win. This match was particularly clunky in places. Shotzi is just not that smooth in the ring and both Liv's DDT and the oblivion looked rough in this one. Nothing catastrophic by any means, but not a match you need to go out of your way to see. Two out of five. Madcap Moss and Xavier Woods are backstage playing WWE 2K23 when LA Knight walks in and makes fun of them. Xavier asks him what his problem is that he's complaining to them about not being on WrestleMania and Xavier says he will gladly beat LA Knight again. LA Knight then breaks Woods PS5 controller and walks off. Hey man, that's a scrap. Those things are mad expensive. Triple H then came out to address the WWE fans and began by spewing a bunch of WrestleMania propaganda before getting to the actual point of his appearance. Triple H announced that in a few weeks they will have the WWE draft and every single WWE star will be eligible. There's hoping they go back to the really fun 2007 to 2011 format. I really like that. Triple H then welcomed Rhea Ripley and Judgment Day. Rhea says April 1st, 2023 will go down in history as the day that WWE changed forever because she beat Charlotte Flair. Finn Balor then says that Edge had to split his head open in order to beat him, and yet he is still standing. Then Dominic got on the mic and got nuclear heat. Like, 
Night after WrestleMania 33, Roman Reigns levels of heat. Dominic says he couldn't hurt his dad, but that's more than Ray could do, and says his family can go to hell. They show the recap of Bad Bunny getting attacked on Raw, and then Damian Priest said he hopes Bad Bunny can forgive him because he has forgiven Bad Bunny for making him do what he did. Rey Mysterio and the LWO then came out for their tag match with Dominic and Priest. This was more entertaining stuff. Santos Escobar got worked over in the early goings before giving Ray the hot tag as Ray tried to hit the 6 one nine on Dominic, only to be stopped by Rhea Ripley. Zelina Vega hit Rhea with a Hurricane Rana, and Priest got a blind tag just as Ray hit Dominic with the 619. Santos went for the Phantom Driver, but Priest hit him with the South of Heaven for the win. I don't really know what the direction I would like to see all this go in is, but this very much felt like a match that could have taken place before Mania, just with Ray now willing to fight his son. The Triple H announcement gets a 3 out of 5, the Judgment Day promo gets a 3 out of 5, and this tag match also gets a 3 out of 5. It is announced that Shinsuke Nakamura will return to SmackDown next week, and Sami Zayn went to talk to Jey Uso backstage. Sami told Jey that the bloodline is crumbling, but he doesn't have to just stand by and let it happen. There's a commotion, and Sami runs to see Kevin Owens with a production case on his leg, with Solo Sokoa being led away by security. Sami tells Kayla that the bloodline aren't the only ones that have a problem in need of solving now. We then got the main event between Jey Uso and Sami Zayn, and right off the bat, I feel like this match should have been much more than what it ended up being. Again, not saying this was bad by any means, but the Sami Zayn versus Jey Uso match kind of felt like a really big deal, like a big enough deal to be a featured match at a premium live event or something like that. Maybe it wouldn't have been so noticeable if we didn't get such a lame finish. Jey Uso tied Sami up in the ropes and then the ref distracted himself so Solo could hit the Samoan spike and Jey could hit a kick and get the win. These refs are so bad, y'all, and I'm starting to get really sick of this constant outside interference, and I know that's kind of been the story of this whole Bloodline thing, but they're getting really lazy with it, and it's really making these matches suffer. Maybe I'm just sour because this is real close to the finish of WrestleMania that I did not like at all, but this had me down. After the match, we had a nice touch as Solo went to hit the spike again, but Jay stopped him before super kicking Sammy and telling Solo to get a chair. This is when Matt Riddle made the save and chased off the Bloodline to close the show. This was a decent enough main event segment, but for Sammy versus Jay, I was really hoping for more. Three out of five. And so overall, this was kind of a middle of the road episode of SmackDown. The action and everything was solid, but I don't think anything on the show actually felt like it had progressed since WrestleMania. Also, still no call-ups in case anybody was wondering. This SmackDown gets a three out of five. But before we get out of here, of course, Sat and I have a meeting with Pete. And before I get to that, make sure that you check out the first video on our new channel cutscene entitled The Perfect Mario Brothers Movie you'll never see. And now, we've got a secret meeting with Pete. Come on, Sass. Let's go. I've gathered you both here because everybody else has got WrestleMania now. We are the only things left between WrestleTalk and Chaos. Wait, Okada's here? No, wrong Chaos. Oh. Well, what do we do? I don't know. We could always join them. No, Sam, why would we join them? It's just a suggestion. Look, we don't even know if this thing is reversible, if there's a weakness, we have no intel whatsoever. Honestly, I'm out of the loop. What are these um, WrestleMania symptoms I should be looking out for? Well, you might start talking about unrelated wrestling things, quoting promos, cutting your own promos on stuff, but the biggest giveaway is when you start wearing costumes. Is it me or is it hot in here? I neither get hot nor cold. No, it's, it's pretty mild. Damn, I feel hot. My temperature's rising. Where did that jacket come from? Wait, you've got WrestleMania too. I've always had WrestleMania. I'm patient zero, baby. Now hot tag me, brother. Run. <laughs> <laughs> If you ever looked at the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie and thought, why doesn't this look anything like Super Mario Brothers? I got a feeling we're not in Brooklyn no more. Nintendo probably thought that too. After all, there are claims they even considered putting it in a vault so that no public eyes would ever see it. It's basically the video game equivalent of Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. In 